All right, we're live on video. Stand by for audio. Good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another of the Fuel Show. So today, in my time, it's this evening, I am catching up with, yes, yet another new guest co-host. And uh, I'm excited because me becoming a new author right now for going into 2019, she's also an author. But let me give into the bio here and help you understand this is going to be more of a health-focused show, which you know I care a lot about. We talk about health, business, and lifestyle. Uh, but this guest co-host, she's into the holistic side, ladies and gentlemen. We got some holistic health coaching, a food abuse counselor, and an inspiring author, as I hinted, of why can't I stick to my diet? Let's throw an exclamation on the, on the end of that uh, question mark because a lot of people are frustrated with this. And, uh, but it's how to end the food drama. And this is her philosophy, simply put, is you know, health isn't a number on the scale or how often we exercise, but our lives as a whole. So I love that component. So there's more to her. We're going to dig deeper into her because we do have a long format show. So without further ado, and for the video feed, I'm already showing up her book right here, ladies and gentlemen. Erin uh, Wathen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And actually, full name, Aaron Boardman Wathen, if people actually get the book, ladies and gentlemen. And it is yeah. on Barnes Noble and uh, also the powerful Amazon. <laughs> because everybody, if you're on Amazon nowadays, I really think you can't exist. I don't know. What do you think, Aaron? I don't think if you're on Amazon, you do exist. <laughs> we literally had this, I was meeting with a client before this uh, two hours ago, and we were discussing the future of how their company could somehow intertwine uh, and their industry in the Amazon world, they're not intertwined yet. And they're kind of worried because they worried that Amazon will swallow them up. And I said, well, use it as a tool. Authors are doing it. Now get, get that distribution out there. So It is crazy how much Amazon has changed publishing. And now they're going into grocery stores. So you can only assume, aren't they going into um, like benefits and healthcare? now as well didn't they uh, there's with all kinds of rumors i mean they've got the money <laughs> no, i'm just saying back before i had kids i worked in human resources and my specialty was benefits mm. so it makes sense that if they're going to change publishing what makes it does why not scare me <laughs> i used to work in the call center uh, world for 10 years and I worked heavily one-on-one -on -one with our HR departments with hiring and, and bringing the right talent in uh, for the call center environments because I was coaching and developing and then managing them in the ongoing space. And HR is not something you just dive into. I don't no. know what you think about that. <laughs> no, HR, you either are or you're not, are not an HR person. And you have to, first of all, like, like people. <laughs> so that they're eliminating Really? Is that a thing? I should probably I like them. You like them, you have to want but you have to also be able to balance the needs of the business without being too one way or the other. But when it comes to healthcare at the end of the day, like there's a lot of requirements like legally that we have to fulfill. And I don't know what a huge, you know, mammoth company like Amazon could do to that. And when I like take it conspiracy theory with like, you know, Washington or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, just considering what they've done to publishing in like the last five to eight years, you can only like extrapolate that, what they can do to benefits. Well, and I'm, I'm a perfect example of that I didn't even think about self-publishing until I joined a mastermind group and they're like, oh, you've been trying to get a book out? Like, why don't you just self-publish through Amazon? And I'm like, oh, they do that? ADP. Yeah. So I'm, I'll, I will be self-publishing in 2019 through Amazon. Nice. So, and the thing about that is it's you know all the i mean you can always also take that and do so many things that it's you know it's an awareness tool blah, blah, blah. but also if you want to get a traditional publishing deal you can give that as an example of, hey i can write a sentence yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's the beauty of this like i'm trying to get the content out there faster and i don't have time to jump through all the publishing hurdles like you have done because you're with morgan james publishing right so yeah and it took over a year to get that in stores yeah so and again, let's, I'm not trying to rip on traditional publishing. I, I just, all of a sudden when I heard there was an option, it's interesting. This is kind of ties back. Obviously we're going to talk about health, fitness and wellness today too, is that, you know, trust your gut and go what feels natural with you and make it work for your lifestyle. And for me, I was like, hmm, self-publishing. Yeah. I want to dig into that. 
because I don't have 10, 15, $20,000 to get going with a publisher or whatever. If, if I was trying to self publish on my own without Amazon. <laughs> yeah. And the thing about self publishing too is you can always like take it down and make it better. Like, mm. <laughs> I mean, you own it. So it's Good not, point. yeah, I mean, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. You decide you want to take it and make it better or take it and have, you know, Simon & Schuster buy, I don't know, whatever you want to do. So it's still yours mm. and you can give it away. You can sell it and you can, you know, whatever. But I don't know what your book's about. I'm assuming it's something really good. But yeah, you don't, ha you don't have to wait. And also, like, if you want to do anything with like pictures or recipes, add another year. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it can take years, even if they do like you, to get it in the stores. So there's, a good, there's a good friend of mine that went through that. She's uh, actually, she's the voiceover artist for the intro and outro on my show because she's, oh, cool. she's a professional voiceover artist for, I don't know, she does stuff for NBC and ABC and everything else, but her cookbook is amazing. It's called Eat Happy. And uh, because she has spent her whole life suffering with uh, celiac disease, like hardcore mm -hmm. celiac. And uh, she's been on a, yeah, she's been a guest. She's been a regular co-host for the Fitness Confidential podcast with Vinny Tortoridge for years. And she finally said, wait a minute, Vinny's lifestyle, he owns a trademark NSNG, no sugar, no grains, which is part of my lifestyle. And she's like, oh, all of a sudden that's positively impacting her you know, lifestyle and her condition. So she was so inspired by it. She's like, you know, there's not enough recipe books out there helping people like me. And she created the Eat Happy Cookbook, which is all sugar-free, grain-free recipes. And she obviously is selling it on Amazon. Uh, but the publishing route, that's an adventure. You know, she does have a publisher. She didn't self-publish it. You got to put high quality photos in and everything else. And now she's trying to release her second edition. And that was supposed to come out. That's supposed that's to be called Eat Happy 2, like T-O-O. And that was originally, she was hoping to have it out by October. Now it's not coming out till the spring of next year. So I, I can hear some of the frustration when I talk to her about it. <laughs> Is that because of her publisher? I don't know. She doesn't really give the details. She just hints that, well, we're pushing back the timeline once again. So what would you read between the lines on on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, like with me, I was told it was going to be one date. Then they pushed it to right before Christmas because they thought my book would be a great Christmas present. I was with four men mm. around a table and I said, why on earth would this be a good Christmas present? Who are you going to give a book entitled, why can't I stick to my diet too? They're like, our wives. I'm like, do you no. want to stick until Valentine's Day? This is not like, I'm like New Year's resolution crowd. Sure. But as a Christmas present, I'm like, I can give it to my friends, but I'm pretty much the only one. So I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I mean, you being a health coach know how, how do, I, how do I say this in a nice way? It's really important to adapt to your customer, ergo client, ergo audience. And you usually don't throw that right in their face. Just saying, especially if it's your significant other, wife, fiance, like I would never do that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's one of those things where I can ask my husband to buy me a Peloton, but Ooh. if he just bought me a Peloton, I'd be really aggravated. By the way, we have one. So this isn't Ooh, I'm so jealous. Oh, so, but my point is it's, I would, I, in order for, you know, domestic relations to be copacetic, it, <laughs> it would have to be handled the right way. Right. If someone just buys you a gym membership, like what, what does this mean? What are you saying? What are you implying? And also if you have a socialized woman who's conditioned her whole life to not like her body, and maybe she's drop dead and gorgeous naturally and perfect, whatever that means, or she's been struggling her entire life and loves herself, who knows where she is on the spectrum, the odds of that not setting off a couple of warning bells, slim to none. Hmm. So how it's handled is also important. That's true. Like I could, if I, I mean, I'm, I'm engaged. So, uh, but if I was dating and it's Christmas back to your, you know, the, the joke here, so to speak on when it's time to release this book, uh, <laughs> I could be dating a very athletic and I do like my fiance and I, we're both CrossFitters. We're very big into endurance sports. She runs half marathons and marathons and I, well, no, she hates, she hasn't done marathons yet. She doesn't like that. But, um, I've done years of cycling. I'm a former spinning instructor like you. And so we're big in endurance sports. So 
Yeah, I could buy her a gym membership, but one, we're already members of a gym, but two, I would never say, hey, baby, here's your new gym membership. I would wait for her to ask for that type of thing. So yeah. <laughs> that would not go oh. over well. Uh, now, she was telling me last year that she wanted to increase her swimming training. So I found a swimming facility uh, that we took some lessons at, and I bought her a couple months worth of membership there because we had already gone there and she had hinted that she wanted to increase her swimming training. Ergo, okay, she opened the door. Now I can get that for her. <laughs> so, and it was a success, I'm assuming. Oh, absolutely. She's like, why'd you get this for me? Now I have to go swimming. And I said, you're the one who told me you wanted to swim more. She's like, all right, you got me. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. Yeah. There you go. Well, because we, we were both preparing for a triathlon. So I was like, you said you got to swim more. You didn't have a swimming membership. So I got it for you. There you go. So it was fun. Now you're going to be more efficient. <laughs> yes. And, and now she loves going swimming. So there you go. Perfect. But again, to your point, I'm not going to just say, well, I think my fiance needs to swim more because I know it's really good for physical conditioning and good for, you know, management of the body, et cetera. So I'm just going to go ahead and just buy this for her and assume that she's going to love it. I'm going to ask some questions, probe into that prep, see where she's at on the timeline. And then when I've heard it enough, then I will go ahead and buy something like that. But I think the most important thing here is the, is the probing questions. Cause I've been around health and fitness. I don't know how long you've been around. I've been around for 20 years. So, um, you, uh, you're definitely at a much different level because, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, she's vinyasa yoga instructor, classical Pilates instructor. I already hinted at spinning instructor, the wellness coach side. Clearly, you might care a little bit about health and wellness. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've seen it all and <laughs> you know, I've been through it all. But, you know, I've done CrossFit. I did Tough Mudders. All, you know, I used yep. to take running classes in Central Park. Yeah, I love OCRs. I just, yeah, I just got back from surfing in Costa Rica for a week. So, like, you know, I've done, done a lot of, you know, athletic-like things. I worked out the day before my children were both born. Actually was in labor. Didn't realize it with the first one. I just thought something was going on. Anyway, but my point is, is, like, when you're around that world long enough, you've just seen it all. And there's a lot of, like, themes. And you can't make someone want to work out. You just no. can't. <laughs> it's got to make sense for them. <laughs> just like I do not like to Zumba. I, I didn't care how popular it was. Whenever it was popular, it was never my scene. But we, yeah, you at least tried it, right? I tried it. I was like, yeah. I look ridiculous. I'll, I'll, do, I'll teach the TRX classes if you need me to, or I'll teach bar, but I'm not a Zumba. Or so now you see, I've done Zumba. I've tried bar. I didn't like either of them either, but like after my meeting two hours ago, we closed out the day by doing a yoga session. So I love yoga. So yoga balances me because I can't keep doing all my extreme hardcore sports stuff and then not have something to help calm me down. <laughs> yeah. So I do see the balance of a good yoga session. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's great for breathing exercises too, when you're really getting into it. So. Yeah, no, even the other day when we were surfing, there was a guy that I've known. And he, he was like, I'm not breathing when I'm surfing. And we were out like, do you know anything about surfing? I, yeah, I have to get up. That is the one sport I've mentioned this on this show that I just suck at is swimming. So I need to swim first before I can be able to go surfing in my experience because I freak out in the water. So okay, you, well, anyway, you, so we you were, found my Achilles heel. <laughs> uh -oh. So we were in the back, meaning like behind the waves. Yeah. And the guy who's like a movie producer and blah, 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 blah. He's like, Aaron, I'm not breathing. And by the way, he had a surf instructor with him. And I said, well, why don't you inhale to prepare, exhale when you exert yourself. And then when you push up, inhale again, when you pop up, you know, I, basically I was getting him to like kind of almost do a Pilates sort of yeah. inhale. And he's like, oh, that's really a good idea. And I'm like, yeah, I'll send you a bill later. <laughs> but <laughs> he was just holding his breath the whole time. Yeah. And he was just yeah. trying just to like, you know, white knuckle it. And he was, you know, falling every single time. He attempted to do that away. goes back to my childhood. I remember that when I, I studied martial arts. So when you prepare for a powerful strike, uh, as, you, as you assume your form and position, you draw your air in. 
And then you, you channel that energy from the belly and you key high, you, you, you exhale and explode with that loud sound as well, but you're just forcing that maximum exhale. So as you strike, you have exponentially more power. So it's that explosive movement. You, you exhale with that explosive movement. If I was trying to punch holding my breath, that would nowhere near be the same level of magnitude. So that's just childhood education there. <laughs> <laughs> so I've carried that knowledge though into like other sports. Like, oh, you're getting ready to jump over a wall on a Spartan course. As I'm coming in on, I'm taking a deep breath in. And when I go to explode and explode and leap up onto that wall, I'm exhaling, exploding up that wall. So. Yeah. I mean, you and I could totally geek out and say why that works, but just trust us that it works. Yeah. Now, again, I can't speak to I can't speak to surfing. That is all you, girl. I mean, I mean, I'm jealous of that too. You you mentioned the Peloton bike, being a cyclist, love it, and then you mentioned surfing, which is on the goals list because I'm an adrenaline junkie. I just got to get over my fear of water. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of important. So let me know when you're over it. And we'll go. Well, I uh, I did try my first triathlon this year with not enough swimming training to help me get over that fear. We'll just say that. <laughs> I taught swim lessons in college and grad school, so I'm fine with the water. It doesn't mean I want to like paddle for hours and hours, but no. I, I uh, let's see. I, t- I turned 41 in September, so this would have been I was still I was 40, and I was like I set the goal. I was like, dude, all right, I got, before I turn 41, I got to go try my first triathlon. So I bought that membership for her to do the triathlon. So we started doing some training, and even my even the, the head the head trainer at the facility, he said, Scott, you probably haven't had enough training. Um, but if your heart, you know, I, I signed up for a sprint distance triathlon and I was like, that's just how I do things. I, I just got to go for it. And I thought I could do it and I busted my butt and made it to that first buoy, but it took so long that the, I don't know, safety people, lifeguards are like, um, <laughs> your pace is not so good and we need to pull you. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I, hey, I, that was the longest I'd ever swam in open water. I had never actually swam in open water. So my training was in a pool. So, oh, so you actually didn't do the course beforehand. No. <laughs> yeah, I know it's ass night when you hear it. So, I just wanted to make sure you knew what you were saying. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh, I I was not the again. I I know from a fitness training background that was probably not a good idea. I had pre ran the course, pre biked the course. Felt that I was like I really don't want to pre-swim it because I've never swam in open water. I'm just going to go for it and hope for the best. So, so the, the fact that you were resisting the swim should have probably alerted you to the fact that that was going to be the problem. Hey, I never said I wasn't a jackass. I mean, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, anybody else, right? let's, let's just go right <laughs> forward. I mean, you talk to my fiance, she will reinforce that exponentially. <laughs> so I do a lot of other things very intelligently. And there's other things where I just sometimes have to be that, uh, uh, what do you call it, bowling ball at a china shop or whatever you want to go with it. And I just, I still can't get over it. Even though I know mentally that's not what you're supposed to do. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm that guy. So, (laughs) so I will not be getting, I've been on a surfboard and I've paddled a little bit close to shore. I've never tried going out to, what'd you call it? The back, what? The back, yeah. Yeah, the back. Oh, it's just called the back? There's not like the back zone, back water. It's just the back. Backside or the outside or whatever you want to call it. I mean, See, I have to learn this because you have to back this up. You're in Costa Rica, girl. Come on. How gorgeous is that surf country? Ugh. Yeah, it's amazing. But I didn't even start surfing until I was 40, even though I grew up in California. Okay. I went to grad school in Hawaii. I just decided like I wanted to learn at 40. Hmm. And I'm not very geographically compatible with such a hobby, given that I live outside the tri-state area but i mean yeah, I, I live an hour north of philly whereabouts are you connecticut oh okay you're in yeah so good well we are team time, time zone so yeah i'm like i'm an hour half hour and a half west of new york city hour north of philadelphia and allentown pennsylvania so it's oh, okay got yeah, it it's super easy at connecticut you're like uh two and a half to three hours from me so okay but uh yeah i would agree that's <laughs> if i was looking at surfing Probably wasn't thinking about Connecticut, so. Yeah, no one would. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, now, it's funny because if you go, if you trace the roots far enough back, obviously, I've read through some of your bio and I've skimmed through the, the new book because the book didn't come fast enough for me to read the whole darn thing, but I, I really try to dive, it, dive in as much as I can before I meet my guest co-hosts, especially authors. And I, I mean, I know, obviously, from your bio and your background, I think that's important that the listeners understand that 
yes, you're passionate about being a holistic health coach and a few of you's counselor and everything else, but you do have some backstories behind what fueled the fire to get you into all the tough mutter stuff and the, you know, still willing to embrace surfing in, in your forties. Oh, oh, and why, why the heck not? Let's write a book. Uh, <laughs> so has that just carried you throughout the rest of your life from that, the roots, the history, the, that, that the shift that you had to go through and you can yeah, go ahead and catch our audience up on that if you wanted to. So. I know it definitely did because I you know, was very active, but then I never really understood why my body didn't look how I wanted it to be to. I wasn't ever by any means like fat as you would call it per se, but I didn't necessarily like how I looked like I should have. And what are we hitting at here? Like the, the classic, like the lean and mean quote type of thing or def, like defined definition of the yeah, body. Like defined, or like, I always was like, you know, I just feel fat or okay. I had just like, thoughts of like when I in my book I talk a lot about how it was like a white noise machine I was always like obsessed with like how many calories something had or if I got to work out that day and not because for like mental health or like anything with my body it was more of like I have to burn calories so I can eat something okay because now when I work out or I'm active it's because I like it it makes me feel good it's my time where my kids can't bother me <laughs> or whatever <laughs> versus back in the day it was well if I spend an hour on the elliptical, that's 600 calories and that's blah, blah, blah. So I was coming from it from a different perspective. And you think about so much of our life, it's the intention behind it, right? So the reason a lot of my activities ended up in a very dysfunctional place was because I wasn't doing it from the well-being perspective like I am now. It was more of like, how much of this do I have to do to eat what I want to eat, hmm. which was very twisted thinking, but it got me, it got to me over years and years and years. I was very much in like that dieting perspective, that dieting culture that a lot of women, and I know a handful of men grow up in and of, you know, we're always dieting, looking for the next thing. Is it the cabbage soup thing? Is it paleo? Is it vegan? Is it... I'm, I'm very passionate on where you're going with this because I can't stand the word diet, even though from a marketing standpoint and from your book, you had to use it because people need to understand the word diet has become a negative connotation. I've said this multiple times on other shows that it's, a, it's become a short-term mindset thanks to bad marketing and sales approaches and uh, the, the muscle head magazines and whatever you want to consider your influencers. Uh, I really push and coach the lifestyle component. Like what are you doing to create a sustainable lifestyle that you can always fall back on and adapt to? Not this, oh, what's the next crash diet thing, right? Um, am, am I crazy focusing on that lifestyle versus diet? It sounds like you and I are on the same page. No, you and I are on the same page completely because it wasn't until I realized I needed just to find a way to eat, which is like, I call it a food plan. People call it a protocol. You might call it a lifestyle, but a way that you agree to eat all the time for the most part, that is reasonable and not in any way, shape or form good or bad. It's just how you're living. Like yeah. I always tell my clients, like you want to be food neutral. Like, do you have an opinion about air? And they're like, what? I said, do you have an opinion about air? And I was like, no. I said, you shouldn't have an opinion about food either. Like, you need it. It sustains you. You shouldn't be scared of it or love it or fear it or it's your best friend. It's just something you need to survive. But the fun of your birthday should be your friends and your family. It shouldn't be the cake. Well, it's so like... Like, like it, we, you and I are talking during the holiday season. So everybody's yeah. like, oh, girl, I'll, I'll focus on all that stuff you know, on January 1st or 2nd. And I said, I never stop focusing on stuff. I know how my body performs and, and fuels off of the right fuel, the, like real food, not, uh, not, I don't know, Nabisco crackers. I don't know. <laughs> There's so many different <laughs> things I could bring up right now, right? It's like, so that, that's yeah. why it's like, I, to your point, it's like, yeah. And some people call me crazy because I live an NSNG lifestyle, like the no sugars, no grains. I'm like, because as an athlete, I know what happens inside of my body when I eat that junk. My knees all of a sudden go from never hurting to hurting. 
or I wake up even more sore the next day than I was before. Like, don't get me wrong. To show love to my mother, I ate her baked apple pie, okay? That's what you do on Christmas. You eat your mother's pie and you like it. <laughs> but let me tell you, <laughs> the, the next couple of days uh, this week, I was, I was hurting a little bit more and I had done like three huge workouts uh, for the holidays. We do a lot of charity workouts, but I felt more sore than I normally do. And I've been CrossFitting since I was a firefighter in 2010. That's how I found it. So it's like, I know because I'm this tuned in. So that's why I'm yeah. interested to see your, your debate on that or, or not debate, but like our understanding of that, because to your point, you really try and teach people not to be afraid of food. I try and teach people to understand what is actually food and what's just junk and fillers that you're going to feel like crap on. <laughs> yeah, I know. For me, it's the same thing because, you know, whenever we, we don't have a food plan because we're like with a lot of women I've noticed we're either good or we're bad. We're either on or we're off. And meaning we're either dieting or we're eating in a way that's going to make us gain weight. Those are the only two sides of the coin. So you're starving yourself, you're working out constantly, you're miserable, or you're ordering a pizza and eating ice cream and downing it with a shake. Hmm. There's never just living. So when we're just living, we've found a way that we're eating that is reasonable and oh, there's my kitchen. That's right. <laughs> it's reasonable. For the video feed yeah. watchers on YouTube, we're doing some screen sharing, <laughs> showing off the, for the, um, for the listeners, Erin Wathen Wellness. That's it. Just her name, people. ErinWathenWellness.com. So we're just doing some screen sharing while you catch us up on how you help people. It's just, you know, a way to eat that's, you do it 99.9% .9 of the time where you always eat a lot of vegetables and you eat lean meats and you eat fats that aren't, you know, made up in a laboratory. Yes, healthy and fats like avocados and, and olive oil. Things that live in the perimeter of a grocery store, like that's a really good way to think about it. Like you don't need grains, you don't need sugar, you don't need wheat thins, and you don't need ice cream. And so many of us have this like mental construct about like you can't have your birthday without a cake. I'm like, and yet you can. So, but initially this is such a like, huge non-starter for people. It takes them a while to get used to it. But when we know more and truly get it, like the whole like gut biome thing. Oh um, my God, gut biology. Yes, hit it, hit it girl. I was, <laughs> I was reading somewhere and I heard this a million times, but I hadn't heard it lately about how, what, how, you know, how you, when we eat a bunch of junk and drink a lot in December, how more likely we are to get depressed because of the gut biome is so off, mm. which I kind of knew on a certain level. I mean, I've written about like, you know, sugar makes you depressed and recipe makes you depressed and blah, 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 blah. But I had forgotten about like this component about how our immune system is in our gut and how, you know, it feeds off the junk and yeah, there's healthy bacteria and there's bad bacteria. Yeah, and there's a bacteria you get from like snowflake cookies, which is nothing good. And then all those martinis. And then we're wondering why we're crying in a, the mall because of the Mariah Carey song. Well, the Mariah Carey song is annoying anyway, but it's also <laughs> going to make us more likely to think of like the guy that broke up with us or how grandma's gone or, or whatever, because our whole system is off because for the last 30 days, we've been abusing it. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to get that back. So, Sure, on the second, you could do a green juice cleanse, which I think is a bad idea, but that's in a second. Guy, yeah, I, mm. no. I'm so anti juice. But, um, well, you're basically drinking uh, a sugar bomb. Totally. There's no fiber and there's no protein or fat to yeah. slow it down. So, have at it. Anyway, I'm with you. but <laughs> you preach it. You preach it. I love it. The listeners need <laughs> to hear it. I'm not the only one who says this. <laughs> no, it's just everyone's like, what about juice? I'm like, what about it? <laughs> it's sugar. <laughs> it's sugar. It's just like, but, but mom used to give it to me. I'm like, your mother mom was didn't wrong. know any better. Yeah. And she always gave it to me flakes. <laughs> back, back then, I grew up on a farm. Okay. Well, back then, I was served eggs, bacon, and juice. So I have fats, fats, and protein, and then a little tiny glass of juice. So the balance of that was way the heck better, right? Yeah. So. You had a fighting chance at least. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but then again, how was that OJ made back in the day too? There's also, I mean, it's still, I don't, I don't drink OJ. I don't drink juices. I, uh, it's sugar, sugar. But I have to back it up a little bit. I'm like, well, 
if she fresh squeezed it and she's not adding, it's up in manufacturer in a plant somewhere. Like it, the fact that you have to go into a grocery store and you look at the OJ and one says 50% less sugar. How are they doing that? Well, clearly then the regular OJ must have sugar added. I don't know because I don't drink it anymore. But the point is, is that people need to read the labels, people. <laughs> You know, what's really crazy is uh, last year, right after Amazon bought Whole Foods, I went to, I don't know why they let me in, but there was this like, basically like a manufactured food conference in Chicago. Oh. I, I don't know. And they, I filled out everything truthfully, but they let me in. <laughs> so I, met, okay. I met a guy that helps sells high fructose corn syrup. I met a woman that works for the wheat council. And, and you're like, you let the wrong person in here. <laughs> no, but I was, just, it was fascinating. It was like, you know, just the, just listening to you know, the other side. And when, and the wheat council girl told me, I said, look, I don't eat wheat because every time I eat it, my stomach hurts. She's like, well, you don't have celiacs. It's very, very rare. And I said, I never said I have celiacs. I said, when I eat wheat, I feel bloated. So I don't eat it. So clearly I'm on the spectrum of intolerance. Yeah. And she's like, well, if you ate more of it, you wouldn't be. And I said, that's not how it works. Wait, but I think that probably works for a lot of people. She's ref wait, hold on. She tried to you just say meat. No wheat. Oh, wheat. wheat. Yes, thank you. Okay, because I was she like, was saying, she was saying the reason automatically I went to celiac. Like that's just only said, one. That's what she was saying. She said, Everyone thinks I have celiac, and I'm like, no, I never said I had celiac. I huh. said when I eat wheat, like bread, for example, or pasta, I feel bloated, so I don't eat it anymore. It's an inflammatory I food. I don't, inflammatory. Even like to, I don't even like to call it food. It's I and I, I talked to her about it. Wheat used to look like this. It looks like this, whatever. And, but the quote that I thought was fabulous was, if you eat more of it, you won't feel sick. <laughs> yeah, that's a great like, idea. We're just going to numb the system down. Because I, I've been supporting, uh, I've been doing nutritional cleansing for God since I found it in, after my first year of firefighting in 2010. I used it to help detox my body and just... I was going through uh, chronic fatigue and stuff and the excessive firefighting hours and everything. I was a wildland firefighter out West. I don't know if you knew that. Where, where were in California or someplace? Uh, I, was, I was on a, I was with the U S forest service. So I was on one of the elite hotshot crews. So our crew was based in Arizona, but as a hotshot, mm -hmm. you get shipped all over the West because we go in on all the big stuff. Um, Got actually it. something fun. This didn't exist when I was fighting fires, but I just got my, my hotshot membership association. So there's actually nice. the first time in history, there's actually a hotshots association. And I didn't realize we actually have 110 crews nowadays. Back in the day, I thought it was only 105. So there's only 110 hotshot crews in all of North America. So oh, wow. we were few and far between. So there's a movie about us now. So, um, but the point is that you, you actually, they even put it in a letter we, you kill yourself for, for the whole summer. So instead of working all year long, you just do the same amount of hours in just six months. And back then, even as an athlete, I didn't know any better. I, I didn't know about chronic fatigue. I didn't know about uh, excessive stress and the impact on the bodies and all that stuff. But anyway, I, I started getting into cleansing and, and, and experimenting with fasting and stuff to help my body give those organs you know, a day off and let my body focus on catching up on its natural detoxification process and all these things. So, and that doesn't work very well if you're living off of a box of Wheaties because you're an athlete, you know, marketing. Yeah, FYI, I never ate Wheaties in my life. This stuff is garbage. I tried it one time and threw it out, so. Yeah, all that <laughs> stuff is gross. Right, but, but it's um, inflammatory food. It's not food. If, if you consume a food and you get inflamed and you feel like junk, I don't think you can call that a food. Have you know. seen Bird Box? It just came out with Sandra Bullock. No. It's on Netflix. Ooh, I anyway, don't know. Post, post apocalyptic movie. Anyway. Oh dear lord. Five years after the apocalypse, they find Pop Tarts. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, it wouldn't surprise me because we everybody made a few years ago. Because you and I are probably around the same age. We used to joke around about the Twinkies, right? But here's yeah. the best part. Hold on, you, you know this probably. They, they got rid of Twinkies like a year or two ago, and then everybody got so upset that they brought them back. There is nothing natural in that thing at all. They got rid of it because they knew it was bad, and people complained, so they brought it back. What? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the amount of people that complain, I'm sure, is higher than the number of Americans that vote. I mean, it's just crazy. 
I'm like, this is great. Mankind is self-deprecating. We just keep welcoming all the bad stuff back. So, But the conference I went to, the reason I brought it up is because one of the outbreak sessions was these marketers from one of the juice companies talking about how in focus groups, the, sh- the juice with more sugar is what children want. Of course, it's addicting. That's what sugar it, does. Kids also don't ever want to brush their teeth. That doesn't mean you allow them to. Mm, well, oh, nice connection. You are definitely a parent. <laughs> I know, right? But it was, you know, they were like showing us all these charts and numbers and trying to give us data to like explain why it's cool to add corn syrup to juice. And yeah, you could tell these people believed it. That was what was so interesting to me is. They believe they're they, on hype. They believed it. And, you know, they're feeding their families, probably not this food, but the money from this, <laughs> this company, their jobs. And at one point I was talking to a nutritionist who worked, I think for Stouffer's maybe. And she was an RD, so registered dietitian. So she knew exactly how disgusting the food was. And I said, so how do you like basically like sleep at night, right? I was like, you know how horrible the food is. You know that like the the meat is like prison meat. Like what? She's like, well, I think if I can make it a little bit better for people that have you know lower incomes or less educated, then I'll have help. I'm like, and then you're gonna go like work someplace else, right? You know, <laughs> it's it's sad that that is the how they justify it. Um, you know, it's funny because I mentioned Vinny earlier in the show. He just finished making a movie. We crowdfunded this movie earlier this year, so there'll be a new documentary. We're trying to really blow it up uh, for the health nuts like you and I. But it's the truth behind fat. So the the movie's called Fat a documentary oh, cool. and he brought in all the experts. I mean, uh, people who have done the research like uh, Nita Teicholz and Gary Taubes uh, from Colorado and a lot of these people from the wellness sector and, and heart specialists. And he even, he even actually, cause he, he does make fun of the vegan lifestyle because he doesn't believe in it, but he still respects it. He's like, I, he's like, I've been a, a trainer to the stars in LA my whole career. I, I work with people who live a vegan lifestyle. He's like, I just, it's also my responsibility as a trainer my whole life. He said to make sure people at least understand the truth that healthy fats are good for you. It's actually the preferred fuel by the body. It just takes you time to adapt because of unfortunately the past 20, 30 years of miseducation. And the problem with a registered dietitian is that the RDs are still following and edu- being educated off of archaic knowledge based off of our archaic food pyramid. I mean, what, what would you Absolutely. like to say about that? I'm sorry, what? I say, how would you say, how would you like to weigh in on the, on the, our wonderful food pyramid with the powerful foundation of grains and, and how oh, like are, the 12 servings of grain? Yeah. yeah right. no, RDs are how? How can yeah. you eat that much? I don't, what? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, and that's the thing is like, when I think back to the days of the food pyramid, it's like, you know, back when you were watching Webster, like, it's just like so old school eighties. And then what did Michelle Obama have like the plate? I think they're doing she plate. tried and then she got, she got knocked down. Like she, when she first set her mission, I, and we actually talked about this on a couple of shows like she had the right idea and she had the right mission, but then once she tried flying it up the flagpole, so to speak, and you realize that everybody funding this or who has the money to spend the sugar industry, the grain industry, and the fact that we are still subsidizing grains as a government to this day, they're like, uh, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Go ahead and work on like this little plate idea or something. (laughs) Yeah. Go hang out in your organic garden with your $500 tennis shoes, Michelle. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what I remember happening was she had really good intentions. She'd see her hula hooping every so often in a public school. Yeah. But nothing as far as I could tell really changed. But I remember the food pyramid going away and then it eventually became a plate. But I remember the food pyramid like when we were like, you know, after school specials and watching Webster or whatever. But you know, the 11 servings of grain was what segued into the fat-free 90s, which I, I did a presentation a couple months ago on. Honestly, I didn't know what I was going to do it on. So then, so like two days before, I'm like, let's talk about obesity in my lifetime. And obesity when I was born was 7%. 7, 0, 7%. That's, I mean, that's how low it was. Yeah. And I, I was born in 77, so I'm, I'm with you. So 
but anyway, so the, the crazy thing was the biggest jump was in the nineties and that was the height of the fat free days. So, I mean, it, it kept going up. Don't get me wrong. Like it went up in the two thousands and I'm sure it's going to go up in the 2010s, but what was really big in the nineties was all that supersizing and it was the fat free movement, which is 13 servings of carbs. Mm -hmm. So people are eating tons of bagels with fat free cream cheese and a giant jug of diet Coke. So it's so, sugar on top of sugar on top of sugar. Yeah. And then they here's don't your understand. Food plate. Oh, food plate. There you go. Right. And here's the best part. Look at this. They don't call it healthy fats. They actually call it healthy no oils. Oil. And look at what they're promoting. Olive oil is fine. Canola oil, terrible. Don't ever ingest that Oil's stuff. Horrible. Yeah. But this is, this is on Harvard's website. Harvard. Yeah. Lennis. This, this is, yeah, this no, is, canola oil is disgusting. Yeah. No, you, you can't ingest that stuff. But hey, they've got a giant chunk for fruit and then across from that, a giant chunk for whole grains and then all those vegetables. And here's what people don't understand. You could back this up. Um, aren't there sh natural sugars in vegetables too? Yeah. Yeah. Like so when you, juice, when you juice vegetables, you <laughs> are still drinking sugar. <laughs> like beets. Beets are notorious for it. Yeah. But people don't, again, at the, the point of us having this podcast is not just helping people understand that you got a powerful book, right? Why can't I stick to my diet? But it's also understanding the reason, but the power behind why the food pyramid was wrong and the plate is still wrong. I, I like to believe that in our lifestyle, we can reverse this miseducation, but when you got that much money involved in the process, it makes it even harder. And we have to become our own self, our self educated physicians, so to speak. And you're not an MD, but. Yeah, learn. no, I think this. I think for a lot of, you know, civilians, I'll just call them people that are just living their lives and they just want to like feel better and, you know, not worry about how they look in a bathing suit when they go on vacation. They don't understand why canola oil is so bad. Like their mom used to use it to make brownies when they were a kid. Like what's the big deal, right? We, we didn't know. We didn't know. Or at least you and I didn't know. I'm sure somebody knew somewhere. Somebody. But <laughs> yeah, somebody knew, right? So, but the crazy thing is, is when you have huge companies like Weight Watchers telling their clients you can eat fruit all day, which they used to do. I don't know what they, they do, do now. Like, You're just sitting there on the sugar train. But hey, but, yeah, but Aaron, it's, it's natural sugar. It's okay. And so you have people eating mangoes all day, which is, yes, it's not as bad as sweet tarts, but your body is still getting very excited by the sugar. And it's very easy to stay with a really high blood sugar because you're there already. So let's just not even go there and let's lay off the mangoes. And why are you snacking in the first place? Yep. So, you know, when you have these companies that everyone trusts telling you wrong information for decades, like the whole moderation myth just pisses me off because everyone's like, moderation, moderation. I'm like, that's like a unicorn. Like you don't need to have cookies and snacks and all this other stuff. And even Oprah isn't really eating bread anymore. Like I listened to her podcast the other day and she was saying how she thinks it's a bad idea. Like, so she changes her mind when the marketing makes her another billion dollars. Sorry. Totally. I'll throw it out there. I know. But, the, but my point is, is like, so if you're just someone that's living their life and you're not, this isn't your like love and your obsession or whatever, how much of just the surface level highlights are they getting to make them understand why it's a bad idea to eat fruit all the time? I mean, if you look at the back of a can of Coke, it has 25 grams of sugar. Mm. A Jamba juice has 25 grams of sugar, it has two grams of fiber, which is nothing. So it's not even enough to really slow it down. No, It's literally nothing. So, but people think Jamba juice is healthy because of the halo effect around Jamba juice. Same way frozen yogurt used to be healthy. So there's a lot of just misunderstanding about what is healthy, what is not. You know, I've had clients before that will eat eight Lara bars. Oh, God. Oh, I know. Man. That's I know. okay, but that's the, fem that's the female-friendly health bar, so that's okay, right? Well, yeah, it's got the, the girl name. Yeah. But first of all, I'm like, bars are like for when you're stuck on a plane, <laughs> which you weren't. But or, I just, or I just fast during so the plane that, ride. But but sometimes you just got to get people that like lifeline, but eight of them, that's going to yeah. just put yeah. you into like a coma. 
but I'm and just you're, saying you're on a sugar train. You're just you're yeah, just totally. Just and like I feel like I need more. I need more. And you're it doesn't it doesn't really matter per se that it's not a gallon of ice cream because it's so much sugar and there's really not that many nuts and all those dates. Sure, the dates are better than if you were just like taking Domino sugar and just drinking it. But at a certain point, it's still sugar. So there's this huge misconception about what's healthy and what's not. I think people also, they don't understand what is happening inside the body. And like they think, oh, well, yeah, everybody talks about, they're starting to realize that sugar is addicting to the brain more than cocaine. That's a common thing now that people talk about. But they don't understand what sugar is doing at the liver level. I tell people all the time, like going in your mouth, you could have, it could be dates, it could be orange juice, it could be a juiced juice of vegetables. Once it hits your liver in, in the digestion process, your liver is like, I just see sugar. So I'm being bombarded by sugar, whether it's grains, whether it's you know everything else I just said. And people don't understand that. And that's where the biggest gap battle for my knowledge was learning about the impacts on hormones and how the body is now dysregulated because of that lifestyle and you have to allow time to reprogram it. And I, I didn't get to read a hundred percent of your book, but did you actually bring up some of that in your book as well? I talk a lot about how wheat is just as bad because oftentimes when people quit sugar, they just start main, they just start eating bread. Mainlining it. <laughs> mainlining it, right? Because they think, oh, well, it's just bread. I'm like, but the bread we're eating nowadays is so, is so refined and so nasty. It might as well be a cookie. So it's just easier just to, if you're doing no sugar, no flour, no sugar, no grains, whatever you want to call it, just do it both. Because if you're going to that, you still haven't even gotten to the problem of why are you overeating? Mm-hmm. Why are you going to this food when you are sad or why can't you eat a normal serving of something like that's let, let's take it one step back from what you're eating and the why because it's very hard for me to overeat on a beautiful grass-fed steak i mean yeah. i'm satiated i'm happy i'm full you know yeah if i sat down and grabbed the pizza like i did in college okay i could i used to be able to sit down and eat an entire pizza because you i'm never feeling satiated my, the, the leptin and ghrelin, the hunger hormones are like, oh, yeah. he's, he, he's fine. Keep going. Cause like, oh, that, that tastes so good. And, and I'm, and you know, I'm shutting off the satiation. So it's, I just says, keep going, bro. Keep drinking your beer while you're putting down that pizza. <laughs> Next thing you know, you've eaten like two pounds of food or whatever. Right. Um, no, I agree. <laughs> I think that's a lot of it is that, you know, pizzas, like there's a, there's a handful of foods you hear often. I'm sure you do like pizza, ice cream cookies, like certain foods go down really well and are very easily binged on. Like cook frosting, like there's sort of like almost like a flavor profile or like a texture of what goes down easy. That's what the manufacturing companies are doing. They're figuring out that magic. Oreos Oreos are a great example of a manufactured food to be as addictive as possible. Like the size, like that fits in your mouth, like the ratio of fat to like, I mean, it's like, is, is there any is, fat left in there? I mean, well, in the in the, um, in the cr- cream. Yeah, I was just say air quotes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who are listening now on YouTube. She's air quoting cream. cream. <laughs> so I'm saying is so. There's just the right amount of fat to sugar ratio in the center to make it all this like wonderful experience. People, so they're like grabbing more. So there are certain like you never hear of like a client. Oh my god, I like three plates of broccoli the other day. I feel horrible. I mean, have you ever gotten no. that phone call? No. Me neither. No, that's crazy. Like, I was it my mom? She was making me so crazy. I ate a bunch of broccoli. Like, I never get those texts. We had that discussion last night. Uh, a friend of mine, her mother, they're trying to help her get, you know, live a healthier lifestyle. And she keeps saying, yeah, but I love Wendy's. Well, whether it's Wendy's or Burger King or McDonald's or any of these fast food restaurants, you don't understand that they're paying a well-paid scientist or a team of scientists in a lab to formulate the perfect flavor profile because the food is so crappy that they need to add all this other stuff in to make it taste somewhat palatable. I actually, a good buddy of mine stripped it, stripped down. He, he said it best. Actually, I think Vidding even said this too. I said, listen, man, take, go buy the, the McDonald's Big Mac, but just ask, 
for the burgers only and try and try and enjoy that patty. It's going to barely taste like anything and it's not going to be enjoyable because you need the sauce and the bread and all the other junk combined together to make it somewhat palatable. It's got awful. Yeah. It's one thing to have a really high quality burger from a real restaurant that, you know, like, (laughs) making me hungry. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you know, it's the cow is not disgustingly treated and it's like a real piece of food. But you know, the, the thing about fast food that people don't understand is like, it's all lab created to be, to hit all our buttons. Right. Yep. Because someone in the lab figured out where they were and they're like, check, 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 check. You know, that's why in the potatoes and the French fries and McDonald's are all from the same, like manu- or same like um, farm. So they always taste the same. So that continuity, you always know what you're going to get. So when people say they love fast food, you know, and every once in a while they're like, Oh, it reminds me of my dad or whatever. But usually they like, they like it. It's because they're used to all those boxes being checked. I'm like, can you, if you want to go make a burger and eat it at your house and it's real, that's oh, yeah. a different conversation. But the drive through window, no, no, no more. And let's be real. If somebody's feeling, you brought this up earlier in the show, and this is some of the backstory of the book and stuff too, but it's like people are like, oh, but they're feeling bad. You have, to, you have to put in the mental game work to get yourself to the point where like, how am I going to make myself feel better? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get, fire up my grill, pull out that amazing grass-fed beef I got in my freezer or I have to go to the store and get it, and then throw some bacon on, slice up some fresh avocados, and I'm going to have a beautiful, sexy, healthy fat bomb of food. But let's be real. Here in the U.S. of A. especially, we are an on-demand society. Nobody wants to put the work into it. I'm going to make myself feel better by just going and buying fast food because it's fast. There, I have a 25-year-old brother, and he will just say, Alexa, order Nate's huge, and Domino's will show up in like 20 uh, minutes. <laughs> damn you, Alexa. He's going to kill me for saying that. But We're I mean, supposed I'm just to be saying, using technology for good. Well, I'm just saying like people, I'm sure you could figure connected to Uber Eats or whatever, but I don't know. Like I, when he told me he could do that, I was horrified, but uh, I guess it's very common. So I'm sure if he said order my huge from Burger King, some person would show up with it. I don't know. I don't ask. You know what? But uh, I want that huge to bring up this piece. Hold on. I got to give you some more love here on the, on the, on the share. I zoomed in on, uh, on Amazon, you see the back of your book. I do see the back of my book. I, so I, lo- I love, I love that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sharing the back of her book, and it's. I, I want to just pull it all together for the people listening. In. It's like, dude, she says right. She says it perfectly. Can you imagine a life where you always weigh what you want to weigh, where you aren't constantly counting calories or trying to figure out how much time? This is the most important part here how much time do you have left to lose weight before spring break? And I almost want to modify that and just say, how about we fast forward even further and say, how much time do you have left to live your life? And yeah. that's what I, when I read that, that's what, made, that's what triggered that in my brain. And I wanted to make sure we shared that uh, on the show. So, cause I love that. No, I think it's, it's something that needs to be said because you know, I wrote this book, basically what I needed like five years ago, was what I, who I wrote it for, because I was in that constant, you know, mindset of, I have a feeling I don't like, I'm going to eat something sugary, you know, or I'd see something sweet and that would make me happy. But either way, like, why are my emotions and food connected? Like they need to be separated. Hmm. So a lot of like my philosophy on the whole thing is, so before you get in the drive through before you say order Nate's huge, you need to <laughs> be able to have whatever feeling you have and know that sitting with it is not going to make you implode. Like if you're agitated or irritated or they're stuck in traffic or whatever, that it's just a feeling, it's a vibration in your body. No one's ever died from being irritated. And whatever internal thing you have going on, there's nothing external that can fix it or fix it. 
So you need to, that's just like a basic thing that so many of us don't get, but we're so uncomfortable with really understanding that. And we don't really get taught. It isn't like, okay, today, Aaron, we're going to talk about handling your feelings. No, we talk about math and birds and the bees, but we never talk about managing our feelings. But when we're sad, someone usually gives us a cookie or something when we're kids. Yeah. So and that, that's, that's all psychological programming. Totally. And then on the flip side, we're often told like celebration is food, right? So <laughs> if you see food, you get excited. There's a party because there's food. We're going to get together and eat. So in either direction, there's food and emotions are very intertwined. Like if you've ever, if you're a woman in a holiday, when are we eating? What are we eating? It's all about the food. And don't get me wrong, like we eat in my house. <laughs> like my children are, you know, just I'm giving them like, you know, some sort of IV uh, solution. But like, like I said, like for Christmas, we went to Costa Rica and we ate like very simple fresh food, food. That fresh food somebody else created. And they get stuff, but it's not, it's every, but the main thing was this trip. So, it's not all about stuff and food and consumption and whatever, because it's the experience and who, who we are, but it's so easy to fall into that trap. But when we're kids and oftentimes adults, I like guess even that cliche of like a girl getting broken up with in the sweatpants, eating ice cream, watching the notebook. Out of a tub of ice cream. Yeah. 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 So, but just taking that a step further. So your boyfriend has dumped you. You're watching The Notebook, which is actually a very depressing movie. I, and, I, I teared up in that movie. I'll, I'll man up. I'll admit it. Yeah, I know. It is sad, but she still dies. Anyway, so, <laughs> and also, how could he have written her a letter every day when the mail is only open six days a week? Just side Right? That, uh, yeah, thank you. I, my brain works like that, too. I was like, I'm like hold on. Did they deliver mail on, the, on Sundays back then? I mean, then? now I guess seven days a week mail, but... That's yeah, but you know, it's Amazon anyway. So circling back. <laughs> so with, um, you know, with the girl and the ice cream and the notebook, so your boyfriend and you break up, you're eating ice cream. Once you finally come out of it, yay, you've gained 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. How's that going to make you feel, feel better? No, it's, you're going to feel horrible. You're going to feel sluggish. You're going to feel even more depressed. I'm not going to get into like what you've done to your. And like, it's not just the physical though. It's, it's. No. The, it's like you tied us earlier in the show, your gut biology, your mental health, you're actually mentally brought down further. And now you combine in, oh, now you look yourself in a mirror or look at the scale and you see 10 pounds of inflammatory weight. I like to clarify, like it's, it's, just, it, you can. Not muscles. It. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all, mm -hmm. it can be removed. And the thing is too, is like, maybe you're meant to feel really upset that you and your boyfriend broke up because Oftentimes, those feelings are meant to be felt at the time, but we're delaying them because we don't want to feel them. Instead, we're going to eat, hmm. but sometimes they need to be felt, actually all the time, I think, and instead, people find these ways to get out of it, and a very common way is usually food, yep. so we're going to change the channel through food instead of thinking about how I'm alone yet again, or whatever the heck the, the conversation is. There's a great so, quote from firefighting. You'll appreciate this. Um, we always said, listen, guys, whether you like it or not, you got to embrace the suck. It's part of life. So I, I, I like right? suck it up, buttercup, how, whatever version that you want to create. It's like, that's the point. Okay. It's like, it's like entrepreneurship. You can speak to that too. It's like, guys, like the painful stuff is where you learn the most amazing things. It's the, where the growth happens. The people who embrace the suck are the people who grow exponentially and get stronger. Absolutely. I even talk in my book about, um, there's this kid's book, a kid's song, like going on a bear hunt and you can't go around it and you can't go under, you just got to go through it. So you got to embrace the suck and go through it. And you and your boyfriend broke up and something better is around the corner, but eating a bunch of ice cream, getting really chubby and depressed is not going to help anything. So maybe the best thing in the world is to throw away the sweatpants because that gives you... <laughs> feeling that is okay ditch the ice cream you know just start going to the gym and you will feel better about yourself when you're when you are moving again and fueling your body and all these other things but sometimes you have to 
do it first and then you'll feel better because it's unfortunately you've gotten yourself in this hole with the diet you've been eating for the last couple of weeks where you're going to have to the food's going to have to come first then the good feelings unfortunately because you've been eating gallons of ice cream yeah and i and the thing is it's really easy to stay on that shitty food train over and over and over again i mean it's very easy which is like so you and i are ending the holidays in a couple of days here and what a lot of people don't understand is why a lot of us have a horrible time keeping the new year's resolution to lose weight is because since thanksgiving they've been overdoing it mm -hmm. so psychologically there's a habit chemically there's a habit and emotionally they're used to just doing whatever they want like nutrition be damned right so yeah. and also the compound effect of like when the you know this amount of sugar used to do it and then 2x over six weeks so like any drug you need more and more and more so when people don't see food as chemically impacting themselves they just see it as like oh it's fun it's love it's my grandma when actually it's it can be a very powerful mood affecting drug yeah those six so, weeks that you just talked about you're now establishing a baseline of chemical and hormonal shifts within your body so now you've had six weeks of that sustainability so now it has become become basically an, an addictive state. So now you're going to need that much time, if not more to break that cycle and reprogram. So like I, I joke around all the time and other professionals like you say is too in a different way, but it's like, guys, like you can make shifts between Christmas and, and, and Thanksgiving easily. The real longevity, the real lifestyle component is what are you doing the rest of the year, right? The, where's that's the programming that really matters because then come next holiday season, if you've built that sustainable lifestyle all year long, it's going to be even harder to do those bad things you did last year. That's how I look at it too. It's like, if you got that foundation, if you try to go down that bad pike, I think I truly feel like that's, that's like me. Like I've had two desserts this whole holiday and that was it because I I'm so sustained. Now my body talks to me. It's like, dude, I hate when you do that now. Don't do that. <laughs> so you had the I, apple pie. I got, Hey, like I said, I, and I, I was like, ah, I got to do it. It's for mom. But, and I feel crap the next day. And I, I'm like, I'm good because I'm that healthy. Just, it was just the apple pie or what else was it? Was it? Then the, the best way I did to justify the apple pie to try and help it was I, I, I covered it in heavy whipping cream to get some fats to help balance the sugars a little bit because I was like, dude, I can't eat this. Like, I'm not a kid anymore. I, I know too much. <laughs> was she happy that you ate it? Yeah, you know, my mom's 69. I, I, I was like, I'm not going to say no to the pie. I mean, again, yeah. everybody knows me. Like, I'm an epitome of health. Like, I'm not worried about it. I, I wanted to show people that I'm human. I'm like, okay, Scott will eat a piece of pie. You know, yeah, that's why I always, I'm always so sketched out when people are like, do you believe in cheat days? I'm like, no. No, I don't it, call, I don't like to call it that either. I'm like, guys, like, it's not, I'm not even going to call it a cheat. It's just saying, dude, I know this isn't that good for me. I'm going to do it for my mom. That's it. It's once. It's once a year. Scott's going to have some pie. It's not, I'm not even going to call And that's the other thing. Actually, to back you up, that's not even a cheat day. That's not even a cheat meal. It was a cheat dish. <laughs> if you want, yeah, if you want to put the word cheat on it, fine. There you go. I didn't have a meal. I didn't have a day. I had a piece of pie after the whole dinner. There was no sugars. There was no grains. I was eating meat and fats and eggs. And that was it. So, I was able to bounce through that quite well because of my lifestyle. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, the whole like cheat day concept, it can easily become a cheat weekend, week, cheat week, cheat weeks, cheat month, cheat. It's just cheating. <laughs> so, yeah. and I don't know where it came from. I really want to talk to that person because I don't, think it's a good idea, especially, you know, I love it when a client's like, when's my cheat day? I'm like, you're on day three. Yeah. You, you aren't even off with anything yet. Like, let's Once you reprogram your mindset, you won't look forward to these cheat anything. That's, that's why I love to share with people too. Like I'm just further down the timeline than other people. Yeah. But I, it, yeah, earlier in the game, it's hard. Sorry guys. Sorry ladies. It's going to be hard. You're, you're, you're going to want to dream of the cheat day that reward. I'm like, how is that a reward? Like once you're healthy, I don't look at that pie as a reward. I'm actually, not, I'm actually dreading it because I know what's going to make me feel like the next day. 
So. Yeah, I just remember when um, I used to teach spin, for some reason I would always get stuck with the Friday after Thanksgiving class. I don't know <laughs> why that always happened to me, but I just remember like in the beginning, I was always like, if you overdid it, and everyone was like, Ugh. I said, you're not going to undo it in the next 45 minutes. So nope. let's just move a little perhaps. And if you're still feeling gross, it's cool to be in there because like you can't undo it even calorically you might do it like maybe but like chemically you're not going to undo that so and, and i don't that can't be said enough because so often people are like it's the whole calories in calories out i'm like no it's not Man, i've never counted a calorie in my life because again that's all incorrect education that's all stuff that's in your book like guys ladies and gentlemen i mean she's been preaching it you know for an hour it's stop don't there, I, i've never counted a calorie in my life some people do that People don't even know what the heck a calorie means. There's, I could do a whole, we could, you and I could just do a whole separate podcast about what the actual definition of a calorie is. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, measure of heat units, all this other stuff. I'm not even going to get into it. <laughs> it's yeah, just, I, I think it's really funny to, or fun to do like a show on like just the 10 common misconceptions about weight loss. Yes, yes. Because there's so many, like, like what is a calorie or, you know, what is muscle turning into fat? Um, does an apple turn into a kumquat? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the cellular level, you cannot convert fat and muscle into each other. It's no. they're literally different cells. <laughs> yeah. And like, you're not going to gain 10 pounds from your period, ladies. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just saying it because I know it to be true. I will let so you just, do that. <laughs> I'll handle the period talk. All right. All you. All you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, so listen, actually, and I'll go ahead and leave the door open because uh, I love being transparent on this show. When I have awesome co-hosts who know a lot and are passionate like you, the door is open. You want to, in all seriousness, if we want to plan a follow-up episode where you want to make a list. Like normally we don't program the show, but I, we don't, it's not a program. We should like, what are the misconceptions or misbranded, mis, uh, inaccurate marketing, whatever we want to call it. But it's like the top stuff that in the past couple of years are still being overly used like muscle into fat. And I don't know. I'm sure you ketosis. Can I think ketosis is really misunderstood. Oh yeah. People think ketosis is bad. Uh, and then also people think they're in ketosis. Like I know cause I study a ketogenic lifestyle as well that I am not always in ketosis. I don't even have a blood prick meter. So if I was being that serious, I would actually be measuring myself to see, where I'm at, but if there's a whole, again, whole other show on keto and ketosis and ketogenic lifestyle. And I've had keto experts and oncologists on this show about it. So we've, we've geeked out before. Um, well, no, but I mean, my point is, is like people say they're in keto and then they eat like a bunch of keto truffles. Yeah. It's all bullshit. Yeah. It's like stevia. <laughs> I, there, there's some moron on Instagram that keeps trying to get me to follow him. And he, and half of his posts are keto desserts. I was like, I don't care how you spin that. There is no way that's ketogenic. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I have a, a girlfriend I know who all she does, like her whole business is on swaps, right? So she takes out sugar and puts in monk fruit. And she takes out it's flour so and puts in almond flour. I'm like, well, first of all, it's going to taste disgusting. Second of all, people are still eating sweets. Yeah, because they and think, oh, that chemical derivative or that monk fruit. I was like, Sugar, again, to your liver, sugar is sugar is sugar. Once it reaches the liver and it's been processed, it doesn't see the difference. And I've had scientists back this up, guys who geek out in labs with lab coats. So, And it also goes back to the whole, um, what were those nasty things in the 90s? Uh, they were those- There's a lot of nasty free, things in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, a snack wells. So the, the, the fat free- Oh cookies. yeah, they used to have fat and then they made them yeah. low fat. Yeah, and then they, I, and I used to eat, eat them by the box. That's why I was really chubby towards the end of college. Was because, again, the halo effect, right? Something seems healthy, so we need to eat more of it. So in the 90s, it was snack wells. Also now it's keto desserts or swaps or whatever. When there's still this emotional component of I can just binge away at something because it's healthy. No, you should never be binging. Yeah, the, the binge in general... In general? I had a guy on the show with a book about binging and, and it's because he, he had the psychology background. He's like, guys, you got to break this binging mindset as I mean, the bit, the psychology behind the binge mindset is, is the danger. What is triggering the binge? 
you know, that don't, exactly. uh, yes, you can blame the sugar all you want, but there's a psychological issue going on there. You know, are you dealing with yeah. the root cause? And the thing about the psychological issue of whatever it is, I mean, everyone's different is that needs to be addressed. Hiding in a pan of monk fruit brownies. Sure. I guess it's better than Duncan Hines and a, yeah. a, by like a couple of degrees, but it's still, you know, we're talking about your whole well-being, you as a person, it's still not going in the right direction. You're still rewarding yourself, pardon, pardon the term rewarding, I, I, I say you're destroying yourself, but you're rewarding slash destroying yourself with dessert. It's not f like fuel, it's not body fuel, it's not spirit fuel, it's not brain fuel. Like your brain is 80% fat tissue. You might wanna be consuming some healthy fats, just throwing it out there. <laughs> yeah, no, agreed. And it's still, you're still in that whole mindset of like good and bad and dieting and all this other stuff. While the crazy thing is, is like these sort of books, these sort of businesses, these sort of entrepreneurs, they are very, very popular because people love the idea of keto desserts, right? Yep. And people love the idea of like truffle bombs or whatever, because it's still like they can have their cake and eat it too, huh? but it still doesn't get to why are you eating all these cupcakes? Why are you eating all these brownies? Like what is going on before the brownies that you're not looking at because there's something there that really needs to be looked at that we're not going to get to if we're too busy eating all the brownies. Yep. Yeah. That's a powerful message. Actually, this is a great way to, as we're like winding the show down here and bring it to a close. I love the fact we're closing on the power of mindset and the mental game and searching for those root causes because this manifests in so many other areas of our lives. This isn't just, uh, I think it's powerful that we, we're, ladies and gentlemen, if you're at this point at the end of the show, like this is bigger. Like Aaron hit on something that's we're hitting on stuff deeper, so much deeper than your diet and, and the food and whatever cookbook you're following or the new keto recipe, like guys, like you got to dig deep. You got to embrace that suck. We talked about, you got to, find that root cause. And a lot of this mindset stuff, the psychology stuff, this is legit. This is real. And people are overlooking it or not allowing themselves to embrace that. Um, but listen, Aaron, as we bring the show to a close, you are the guest co-host. So I want to make sure you get the final words and you've been rocking the mic. I, I, I've loved this show. What, what would be like an all encompassing message for you that you would like to bring the show to a close? I mean, you've, you're doing so much. And again, for the video watchers, I'm showing her book again. It's, you know, why can't I stick to my diet for the listeners out there? Aaron Wathen wellness.com. All of this stuff's going to be on the website, but if there was an all encompassing message, you would just want to kind of short, sweet, sum it up. What would you like to leave behind for the people if they forgot all the other stuff we shared today? That it's just food. It's not your whole life. It's not love. It's not your family. And somewhere along the lines, food got out of order in our list of priorities. Like I said, with the oxygen analogy. So if we can just put it back to where it belongs, I mean, it's important. It needs to be high quality, but it's not your friend. It's not entertainment. It needs to be healthy. It needs to be good, but it's not the answer to any of our problems other than hunger. I love that. All right. Let's hang tight. Could be a proper goodbye off the air. Again, ladies and gentlemen, and actually one last little quick share for the video watchers. A reminder, you got, you got the book on Barnes & Noble and Amazon. I was screen sharing this again. I want to actually, I'm going to say this at the end here again. Can you imagine a life where you always weigh what you want to weigh, where you aren't constantly counting calories or trying to figure out how much time you have left to lose weight before spring break? And as I hinted earlier, or how much time you have left to live your life to the fullest, people. But again, AaronWathenWellness.com. Again, we'll have everything linked on the website on LiveTheFuel.com. Thanks for tuning in to another powerful Live the Fuel show where we're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. We'll talk to you guys again soon.